It is truly good to see everyone this morning. It's good to have a lot of our visitors with us today. And it's certainly good to have a lot of our college students back with us for the holiday weekend. You know, there are a few words in our English language that make such a great impact upon our lives. Words like friendship. The stories that came out of Littleton, Colorado tragedy some 24 years ago, we commonly known that, know that as the Columbine High School shooting, has some very valuable lessons on friendship for us. I want to discuss a couple of the characters that came out of that story. One was teacher and coach Dave Sanders. This man was shot twice in the chest as he was helping students out of that cafeteria. The superintendent, or the principal of the school actually, said that Coach Sanders is actually in a safe place, but he chose himself to go to that cafeteria to help some of those kids escape. Danny Yarbo spent summer vacations on his grandfather's wheat farm in Kansas. While a lot of kids his age were playing with toy tractors, he was actually riding on a real tractor with his grandfather. And about two years before this tragedy, he had gotten old enough to be able to actually drive a combine by himself. This 15-year-old kid was killed because he stayed behind holding the door, trying to help the other kids to escape. Cassie Bernal, beautiful blonde 17-year-old girl. In her young teens, she was a problem child for her parents. And when her parents saw her getting wilder, more rebellious, they clamped down on her. And they forbid her to associate with a lot of her old friends and insisted that she start going back to church. Apparently, they allowed her to, to quit church. But two years before the shooting, she won a church youth trip. And when she came back, she came back as a changed individual. She became very devoted in her faith, very active in the youth program activities, and I don't think she could actually foresee how much her faith was actually going to be tested as it was on that day. During that little, <clears throat> excuse me, during that Littleton horror, one of the gunmen came up to her, put a gun to her head and said, do you believe in God? She knew that whatever answer she gave was going to make a big impact whether she lived or died, but she said, yes. I believe in God. She was not going to deny the Lord. And when she said that, the gunman pulled the trigger. In different ways, this coach, this boy, this girl are all heroes. And in their heroic acts, they define for us an essence of friendship. Long ago, a wise man once said <clears throat> in Proverbs 18:24. A man that hath friends must show himself friendly. And there's a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. <clears throat> but you know, being friendly is more than just being outgoing and sociable. We know a lot of people who have this charismatic character about themselves. And everybody likes them. You can't hardly help but like them. But those relationships are not always true relationships. In fact, one old preacher once said, I have many, many acquaintances, but very few friends. And even I can attest to that. I know a lot of people, and I like them, but as far as true friends, I have very few. Today we're going to be looking at some of the factors which go into being a good friend. And if we will just follow the biblical counsel, we not only be good friends, but we will also have good friends. And one thing about friends is that they love with a great love. In John 15, 13, Jesus says, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Coach Sanders and Danny Yarbo literally gave their lives on that bloody Tuesday there at Columbine High School. Cassie Bernal was a little bit different. She didn't actually give her life trying to help people other students get out of the school. But her courageous example may have done a great deal of good in strengthening the faith of many people. Now, of course, I cannot vouch for the details of her faith, whether she truly obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ or some other faith, 
But in her mind, she was, Jesus was actually her friend. And she was consciously laying down her life for him. And I pray that none of us will ever have to be tested like that any time in our lives. In fact, I think few of us can be confident to say that we, how we would react in similar circumstances. May we never find out. But surely, we can understand the love behind such a sacrifice as this, that it is a mark of friendship. Now, also, friends are not looking for material benefits from their friends. You know, we've all heard the term fair-weather friends. These are the people who claim to be your friends as long as life is pleasant, as long as they're benefiting from the friendship. But as soon as those storm clouds arise on the horizon, they vanish into thin air. Solomon, I think, knew what he was talking about in Proverbs 19, verse 6. He says, Many will entreat the favor of the prince, and every man is a friend to him that giveth gifts. If you don't believe that, maybe you get to inherit a lot of money one day, and you'll find out that you'll have more friends than you know what to do with. But the thing about a real friendship is, is that it thrives in adversity. In Proverbs 17, 17, it says, A friend loveth at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. And again, in Proverbs 18, 24, it says, There's a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. Friendship comes from the closeness of another person. This means that sometimes we're going to have to bear one another's burdens. Galatians chapter 6, verse 2. And by this, we have to become involved in that person's life. And this is where your friendship gets really, really close. But also, friends use their influence for good. Having the wrong kind of friends can be very damaging to your well-being, your welfare, and especially to your soul. In Proverbs 12:26. Solomon says, The righteous is more excellent than his neighbor, but the way of the wicked seduceth them. We need to be very careful about the friends that we choose to run with. Sometimes we're not as strong as we like to think that we are, and instead of leading our friends down the right path, we wind up being seduced ourselves and tempted to do evil. That's why we're warned in Proverbs 22, 24. Make no friendship with an angry man, and with a furious man thou shalt not go. The wrong friend in your hip pocket will take you places where you really do not want to go. So we need to choose our friends wisely and carefully. Paul gives the same warning in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 33. Be not deceived. Evil companionships corrupt good morals. And therefore, Paul admonishes us in 2 Corinthians 6, 17. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. Now, one thing that we have a responsibility as a friend is to make our friends better and stronger. Solomon said in Proverbs 27, 17, Iron sharpeneth iron, so a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. Iron sharpens iron. You can take a steel file and you can run it along the edge of an axe head or a hole and you make the usage of that tool a lot better. That contact makes it better. And as Christians, we have a duty of making our friends better people. And by using our influence for good, we can cause others to draw nearer to God. We do this by speaking often of God's will with them. But not just speaking of God's will, we also need to show them that we also are adhering to God's will so that we can be the proper example and influence. You know, Jesus tells us in Matthew 5:16. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. 
Your friends are in the best position to pay attention to the light that has been radiating from you. So is that light shining brightly in their eyes? We're not to do this just to be seen of men. We are to do this in order to glorify our Father in heaven and at the same time have a good influence upon our friends by being that proper example. This is pretty much the admonition <clears throat> that Peter gave to the wives in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 1. Peter said, Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives, talking about the manner of life that they live. A wife should be the best friend of her husband, and vice versa. And if a wife is married to someone who is not a Christian, Peter says she can win that person's soul by the way she conducts her life. And this is a very powerful demonstration of the good that we can do for friends and for family by the way that we live our lives. Can you imagine the impact Cassie Bernal's confession would have had on the lives of the young people that were close to her? In less dramatic fashion, our influence can also make a big difference in the lives of our friends who know us best. So don't ever give up on being a Christian and being a true friend. Like Paul, we can turn the world upside down. But you know, friends also get their friends to hear about Christ. I think the greatest account of conversion we have in the Bible is found in Acts chapter 10. If you want to take your Bibles over there, <clears throat> we're going to talk about Cornelius a little bit, but not so much Cornelius. Usually when we turn to Acts chapter 10, Cornelius is the first one that comes to our mind. But Cornelius was not the only one that heard Peter preach the words of salvation. Now, remember the story. Cornelius was a devout man. He was one who feared God with all of his house, but he needed to hear the words of salvation in order to be saved. Now, an angel came to him and visited with him and told him, you need to call for Peter, who's by the seaside, and he shall tell you words by where, whereby you can be saved in all your house. But you know, he wasn't the only one who received a vision. Peter also received a, a, a vision, preparing him for his mission to be able to preach to the Gentiles because there was a lot of friction between the Jew and the Gentile at this time. And Peter needed some help also. And so this great sheet was let down from heaven with all these animals in it, both clean and unclean, and God told him, kill and eat. And Peter said, I can't do that, Lord. He said, nothing unclean or common has ever touched my lips. And God said, what I have cleansed, don't you call unclean. So Peter went. Holy Spirit instructed Peter to go with the men that Cornelius had sent to him and to go with them to Cornelius' house. When Peter arrived at Cornelius' house, he found Cornelius waiting for him. But I want you to notice what it says in verse 24 of Acts chapter 10. And the morrow after, they entered into Caesarea. And Cornelius waited for them, and notice this, and he had called together his kinsmen and near friends. Cornelius was not the only one that needed to hear these words of salvation given by Peter. Cornelius had the initiative to gather together his kinsmen and his close friends. He wanted them to be saved too. When was the last time you invited your kinsmen and your close friends to church services so that they can hear the words of salvation? You know, your relatives, your close friends, they also need to hear the gospel. You know, we started this lesson, we began talking about the, some of the people in the Colorado High School 24 years ago and some of the brave deeds that they had done. And nothing I'm going to say is intended to, to detract from their heroism. But you know, it is a greater act of friendship 
to lead a friend to Christ, to tell them the words of salvation so they can have the hope of heaven one day, more than any of these people ever did for their friends by saving their physical lives. I say this because of the words of Jesus Christ that he spoke some 2,000 years ago in Matthew 10, verse 28. Fear not them which are able to kill the body, but not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both body and soul in hell. An eternal soul is worth a whole lot more than any physical body, according to God. In fact, Jesus re-emphasized this very thought in Matthew 16, 26. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man, what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? You know, you can put a prize on any physical object in this world. It may be a small prize. It may be a tremendous prize, but you can put a price on it. But you cannot put a price on a person's soul. As friends, we help out our friends with their physical needs. But a true friend always looks inward. This is where the real value of a friend shows itself. Helping one another to go to heaven. <clears throat> That's the most important thing we could ever do. This world's going to come to an end one day. Everything in it's going to be completely burned up. This is not what we are to be living for. We're to be living for the glories of heaven, and we need to be working to take as many people as we can with us. Of course, the best way to start being better friends is to be a better friend with Jesus Christ, who is the greatest friend in this world. I mean, Jesus himself said, Greater love hath no man than this, than a man lay down his life for his friends, John 15, verse 13. And Jesus did that very thing for us. He went to the cross, not because of anything wrong that he'd ever done. It's because of the wrongs that we had done. And he went there for our salvation. And Jesus tells us in no uncertain terms what it takes to be a friend in the very next verse in John, 14, or John 15, verse 14. He says, you are my friends if. That's a conditional statement. That means there's something that we are responsible for. Ye are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. Are you truly Jesus' friend? If you claim you are, have you obeyed his gospel? There's lots of gospels floating around out in the world today. One group over here says, all you have to do to be saved is to believe, and that's it. Others say you have to do something else. Some say you have to work for your salvation. But Jesus tells us what we have to do, exactly what we have to do in order to be saved. We first have to be a believer in him. If we do not believe that he is who he claimed to be, then we're going to die in our sins, John 8, verse 24. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life, John 3, 16. But it doesn't stop right there. He also tells us in Luke 13, verse 3, that you must repent or you will perish. And repentance is having a change of mind that brings about a change of action and a change of direction in our lives. Then we have to confess Jesus Christ before men. That shows us that he really is our friend and we are going to be his friend. We will not deny him. If we do, he's going to deny us before the Father which is in heaven, Matthew 10, 33. And then we have to be baptized into Christ. And the only way to get into Christ is through baptism. That's where all spiritual blessings are found, Ephesians 1, verse 3, including our salvation. You want to be a friend of Jesus Christ? Do what he commands you to do. And we can help you with that this evening. If you have a need, whatever it may be, uh, we encourage you to respond to the invitation. While together, we stand and sing.